In this video, we'll look at meshing and then rendering our fluid teacup splash scene. We'll use our particles to drive an open VDB mesher. We'll make some refinements and then use filters to smooth out that fluid surface. We'll then import this into our full scene and set up a render. So here we are in our scene where we simulated and cached our splash particles and our ripple particles. And this is all cached particle data, so that's looking great. So what we also have is a new scene, which is the scene that's been provided to us by our other artist. And what we want to do is integrate our particle simulation into that scene. So both uh, the other artist that created our new scene, let's just have a look at it. So we use exactly the same cup for this, um, which is going to obviously make life much easier, but we need to import our particle simulation into this scene, which has got some other elements. We've got another, another cup here. We've got some biscuits. We've got a, a teapot and a table. And this is the scene that we're going to render. So let's go back to our simulation scene. So what we want to do is basically just import these particles and their cache. So what we're going to do is this. Uh, what The easiest way of doing it is just to bring the entire system across. Uh, but there's one pitfall that you need to be aware of. If we select our system and hit Control C to copy it, we can then go to our new scene and just paste it in. Control V. But the problem is there's two problems. One is that our particles are in the wrong place because our cup was positioned correctly for us at the world origin, but our artist doesn't have um, this cup positioned in the same place in their scene. So that's one problem that we need to fix. The other problem is, look, can you see the simulation looks like it's got a bit weird? And that's because this is no longer working from cache. If we hit play, it's playing but very slowly. And if we untwirl our system, you can see, look, our cache has disappeared. The, the object's there and the tag's there, but it's gone green that says there's no data. So let's just delete that whole system. And the reason that's happened is if we go back to our simulation scene, what we need to do is go to both caches, the emitter splash cache tag, and let's hold shift and select the other one as well. And we need to make sure that in each tag we have copy tag data checked. And if we do that, now if we copy that system across, it'll copy the tag data as well, uh, the cache data on the tag as well, and we'll be ready to go. So let's go back to our scene. Let's hit Control V. And it took a little bit longer to paste in that time, didn't it? And that's because the tag contains all of that data now, so it's more data, it's moving around. And if we hit play, we've got our simulation. It's in the wrong place, admittedly, but it's there. So what we're going to do now is, let's just come out of this scene camera, which is locked. What we're going to do now is we're going to ignore the scene. Let's, let's just make all of our scene elements invisible. And let's just have a look at our, we'll make that camera invisible as well. We'll have a look at this splash. Now, what we're going to do now is before we position it uh, correctly in our scene, we're going to mesh this. So turn this particle into a mesh, which we can then render. And we'll do that first before we start repositioning anything. So the way in which we do that is let's just open up our system. And there's a few things we can do here. We're not going to be simulating this anymore. Um, so we could get rid of everything. And look, we, we didn't bring across any of our collider geometry anyway. So in this scene, we're not going to use this as a simulation scene. And as such, we can get rid of all of these dynamic objects just to tidy things up. We can get rid of the groups tab. We can. We want to keep the emitters, obviously. We want to keep the generators tab because we're going to be using a generator to create a mesh. We want the utilities and the cache. We don't need the modifier and we don't need the questions or the actions. So now we've got a bit of a cleaner scene. So what we want is to mesh these particles. So let's go to generators and we'll go to the generator list and we want to bring in an open VDB mesher. So let's bring that in. 
So what this needs is a source. So here is our object tab. We're in our general tab here and we've got lots of settings, most of which we're not going to have to touch. Uh, but we will need to say what we want to mesh. So let's drag in our emitter splash and let's drag in our emitter ripples. And what you're going to see is immediately we have a mesh. Let's just make all of those particles invisible now. We don't need to look at those. And if we hit ND to show the lines, we have created this mesh and it's a dynamic mesh which will update per frame depending on what the particles are doing. And if we dolly in, you can see it makes a mesh with quads and it's dynamic. They change as and when the particles move. And what's happening is, what think of it like this, each particle is, um, it creates kind of a mesh sphere around that particle and where those surfaces of those spheres meet, it kind of joins to create one continuous mesh. And there's only really two settings that we need to concern ourselves with in our general tab. And that is, everything else can be kept default, but we want to look at the voxel size and the point radius. These are very important to get the look of our mesh correct. So the voxel size, imagine this as the, 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 the fidelity, the resolution of your mesh. If we reduce this voxel size, you will see that it is a much more um, dense mesh. So it's a higher resolution mesh. And the more we increase that, the more detail that we are going to see. So now it's getting even more detailed. And then we have the point radius. And the point radius um, it basically kind of, it's a multiplier for the particle radius. So if we start reducing this point radius, you will see that it starts to reduce in size. And it's going down and down and down. And as we're getting lower and lower, let's hit NA to hide the lines. So now we're starting to see kind of these individual lumps, but we've got loads more detail in this mesh. But if we go down even lower, it starts to get much thinner, but it's getting really bumpy and knobbly. And obviously we want this to be a smooth, flat, fluid surface. If we go down even further, you can see we're starting to see like individual particles with lots of craters and it's, it's starting to look really messy for what we want. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep our point radius actually quite high. Let's put it at four. And this looks really quite kind of bulbous now and, and not really very detailed. But what we're going to do is use filters to smoothen this out and then make it thinner. So the way we'll do that, the filters are found here in our filters tab. So let's click on filters and we're going to activate filters. And, and by default, there is a median filter in there. And if we click use filters, you'll see if you have a look at the mesh and I'll click it on and you'll see that it's slightly smoothened out, but we're not going to use median. So we're just going to delete that one out. The first filter we're going to use is going to be a curvature filter. Now, these are really useful for smoothening out meshes because they won't kind of encroach on the bits that are already quite smooth, but they'll just try and flatten out the bumps and the points. So if we go to our curvature and highlight it, we can then create more iterations, which means it's going to smooth more and more. And if we put this up to, say, six or seven iterations, it's, it's taken quite a few of those lumps out. If we deactivate the curvature, very lumpy now, isn't it, in comparison? Let's switch it back on. We've got rid of some of those lumps without kind of eating away at much of the mesh. So it's pretty useful for that. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to try and um, thin this out a bit. But before we do, we're just going to try and smoothen this a little bit more. And we'll do that with another filter. So we're going to bring in a Gaussian filter. And let's increase that maybe by one in the width. So now I've got quite a smooth one. If we just deselect that and then reselect it. So what we don't want to do is lose too much of the shape of our splash when we're smoothing it out like this. So let's now we've got the width up to two. It's maybe a wee bit too much. So let's just reduce the strength down a bit, which is going to give us slightly less smoothing. Uh, maybe a wee bit more. 
and a wee bit more. And that's looking pretty good. Okay. So now we're going to try and make it a little bit thinner, which is going to give us that kind of thinner detailed sheeting. And the way we're going to do that is with an offset filter. So let's come down here and we'll pick an offset. And there you can see right away that we've thinned that out. If I deselect that offset, you'll see what it was like before and after. Let's go to a different frame. Let's go a bit further on. And a bit further on. And that's looking pretty cool. Now we could get more aggressive with this. That we could go on two. It's perhaps going to be a bit too much. Let's have a look. So that's thinned out quite nicely. We've retained some of the shape. So that looks pretty good. Let's go a bit further on. Now, one thing to, to be careful of with fluids is if we just dolly in a little bit, we're getting a little bit of bumpiness along this very thin piece, which for a single frame, if you're doing a product shot with a single frame, that would be absolutely fine. But in animation, you may start getting what looks like almost like a dripping down, a waxing down of these polygons as they progress. Um, but that's, it's looking all right, relatively smooth. So what we'll do is we'll cache that out and we'll have a go with it at these settings. And then if we come to do our test render and it looks like we are getting a little bit of kind of blobby animation running down this spike, then we can, of course, make adjustments to that mesh if we, uh, if we need to. So let's leave it at that for now. Let's just go back to near the beginning just to have a look at a frame here to make sure it's looking OK as it comes out. That's looking pretty good. All right, so for speed of working, um, when we're coming to kind of render and whatnot, we don't want it to have to generate all of these polygons every single frame, which is giving us the delay when we make adjustments. Let's just get this cached out um, and then we can work a little bit more quickly. So to do that, um, we don't obviously don't want to recache our emitters because we couldn't recache them. We've got rid of all of the simulation objects in here, so it wouldn't do anything. Um, but we want to base the open VDB mesh a cache on these already cached particles. So the way in which we do that is we go to the cache object and all we need to do is hit build cache. But instead of hitting overwrite, we'll just hit continue. And that means that any object that doesn't have a cache will be cached. But the ones that are already cached will be left as they are. So let's hit continue. That'll start chugging away. So we'll pause this here and I'll come back to you when it's finished. I'll tell you how long it took and we'll have a look at the results. OK, so that took uh, seven and a half minutes to complete. But now we can scrub through and now we have a cached mesh. So let's hit NA to get rid of those lines and we can play this. So we don't actually need to be playing through the cache of the emitters now, which will mean it shall play even quicker. And there we go, we've got our splash. That's looking pretty nice. So you can see what you need to look out for is look at this tendril and as it comes down, is it going to be too lumpy as those lumps are moving? You see we're getting a little bit of stretching and lumping there. So it may be that may be smooth enough to get away with, but we could add more smoothing to uh, to compensate for that. So we could either recache it um, uh, once we've made adjustments to those filters or if you've been provided with an already cached open VDB mesher without kind of the uh, the simulation scene to go with it and you need to just provide a little bit more smoothing what you're able to do is just use a Cinema 4D deformer and it'll work on a cached open VDB mesher so look if we bring in a smoothing deformer make it a child of our mesher and let's Reduce the stiffness way down. Increase that smoothing to, say, 20 iterations. And we're kind of smoothing this out even more. And, I mean, we've even got some really thin kind of tendrils coming out there. But we haven't actually managed to get rid of some of that um, kind of knobbling, which is kind of what we're wanting to do anyway. So for 
this purpose, although we've managed to get even more detail with that, what we'll do is we'll just get rid of that smoothing filter for now and we'll do a couple of tests. So when it comes to render time, we will test render this out. Um, it's looking pretty decent. Obviously, we're not going to be this close up to it anyway. Excellent. Right. So now that is done, um, what we're able to do is integrate this into our other scene. But there's a couple of things that we need to do to make sure that this is um, going to be positioned correctly. So let's go back to our scene elements and make them visible. So here we are. This is what we have been given. And we have our fantastically simulated scene, but it's floating. It's hovering above our teacup. So that's not obviously what we want. But we are able to pretty easily reposition this. Now, if you remember way back when, when we set up this scene, we made sure that everything that we were simulating was positioned at the world origin. And that means that it's very easy for us to then move this whole system, which is at the world origin, into the, the same position as any other object in our scene. And because we used exactly the same cup, which had exactly the same axis center, it means this is going to line up perfectly. So all we need to do is take our system and make it a child of the cup, which is this cup here. And we'll go to the system. We'll go to our coordinates and we just need to zero out our coordinates. So we'll hit the right mouse button zero those out. We could zero out the heading as well, but we'll just leave that for now. And then if we take that out of that system again, and we hit play, you'll see that we're in the correct position. Excellent. And it's worth bearing in mind that uh, if you're wanting to use this technique to move particles, there's an extra step. So let's just explore that. It's worked perfectly with our open VDB mesh. It's in the correct place. But if we go to our XP system and we go to our emitter and we make our particles visible, you'll see that they're still in the wrong place. Even though we've moved that system so it's exactly where our cup was, the particles remain incorrect. And that's because we need to make sure that the particles are being told to be positioned relative to their emitter position. And the way we do that is if we go to the cache tag, go to the object tag, to the playback, we need to ensure local coordinates is active and that will make sure that the particles position is correct to um, its parent emitter. And if we make those... Um, if we make the open video be better invisible, you can see there are our particles. So for particles, if you're moving um, a system around after it's been cached, you must have local coordinates, act, uh, coordinates active for that to work. But for the measure, that's not necessary. Excellent. So there we go. We've got our simulation in our cup. Looking really cool. And that's looking excellent. So let's just explore another couple of things that we're able to do to make adjustments. So let's say that, look, we've got this locked camera that we've inherited. So this is presumably what our art director wants us to do. The problem with this is that the liquid level that we were working on is a little bit low, really, isn't it, for this camera angle? It's OK, but we're kind of missing it. I mean, the splash is supposed to be the hero and it's kind of being obscured by this face of the cup. And let's just say that we are not allowed to touch the camera. So what can we do? Does this mean we have to re-simulate the whole thing? Well, actually, no, we can we can make some adjustments to this. So, look, we can just for one thing, take our system and let's go to the coordinates tab and we can raise that system up, look, and we can just move this wherever we want. So let's move that water level a little bit higher up. So something like that. Okay, let go. So that's looking fine. And that will play through and everything's going to be hunky-dory. There we go. So now we've managed to raise that water level. But if we just come out of that camera again, 
we've actually created because we've because we've moved this up and this cup is at an angle the circumference is greater at this higher point than it is at the lower point so we've created a bit of a gap let's hit nd to see the lines let's see if we can see that so look we've kind of got a gap there between that measure and the and the cup but that's okay because we can now this is cached we can scale it so let's go to our system and we'll go to the scale and let's just increase that by a very small amount let's say 0 0.02 on each axis okay so that's pretty much there isn't it yeah i mean look that that is now intersecting that cup so we've managed to scale that appropriately Let's maybe reduce that a bit, 1.015, uh, yeah, 1.015, 1.015. All right. So we have rescued it and not had to simulate again. Let's go back to our fixed camera. So now we have scaled this up a bit. We've raised that water level. And phew, we've saved ourselves a few hours of re-simulating. Excellent. So look, our cache actually, our particles ran out at this point, but we carried on meshing. So let's clamp our scene to 200 frames. There we go. Excellent. So what else can we do? Well, this is looking pretty nice, and it's uh, a nice enough splash. Let's just play this... Um, let's not play all frames. Let's play this. So this is going to try and play 30 frames a second. So it's quite a fast splash if we're kind of trying to simulate a super slow-mo. So what we could do is we could retime this. So let's just go to our cache object. Let's go to the object tab. Let's go to the playback. And in the scales at 100%, which means it's in real time, look, let's just put it down to, say, 50%. Half speed. Hit play. Now, it's not going to splash until frame 80 now, but there we go, and we've got a much more super slow-mo style splash. So that's pretty neat. So let's keep it at a slow splash like that. We're going to need more frames in our timeline. Put it up to 300. Let's see what that gives us. We want some of these ripples to... Yeah, something like that will do. Okay. Excellent. And now that we have cached our open VDB mesher, we don't actually need to have our emitters in the scene. Because remember, if we go back to our cache object and the object tab, um, we've cached all of these uh, objects and it is an awful lot of data. If we go to, I mean, in totality, we've got two gigabytes, but most of that is taken up by our ripples um, emitter. So if we go to the tag of our ripples emitter, we can see, look, it's 1.65 gig. We've got our simulation set up saved in a different file anyway, so we don't need these two items clogging up that memory. So let's select them, hit delete, and because our mesher is cached, obviously this will still work. We've got a much lighter scene. If we go back to our cache object now, you'll see that we have only got 378 meg. So a big difference um, and it makes everything a little bit more organized and easy to sort out. Right. OK, now that we've got that sorted, we can move on and start thinking about getting the camera, the lighting, the materials and the rendering started. So what we will do first, we're going to use Cycles 4D to do a renderer. We're just going to concentrate on rendering our fluid element in this scene. So what we need to do is change the layout of our Cinema 4D to help with that. So we'll go to Layout and I've set up this Cycles 4D Cup preset. I'll click on that and you will see that it's pretty much the same. We've got our object manager still here, attributes manager in this area as normal. We have our viewport here, which is um, same position, but a little bit smaller, obviously. And then we've squeezed in our real time preview window here. So if we hit play, it's going to render just black. And that's because um, there is no 
uh, lights in this scene, so it can't see anything. So let's sort that out first, and we are going to do some very basic lighting here, but we want a very kind of bright scene, so we're going to use both an HDRI in an environment, and we'll use a nice big softbox to give some nice bright but diffuse light. So we'll go to our Cycles 4D menu and we'll bring in a CY environment. Now, my default, if we go to the environment object, we go to the HDR tab. By default, I have this fake kind of studio lighting setup, and that's going to work fine for us. If we just go to that environment object, to the coordinates tab, if we rotate this um, on the heading, we can rotate through. So you can see, look, if we go around to this way, you'll see that in the background is a photography studio umbrella light. Um, and if we rotate that round, all I'm looking for really is a nice kind of bright-ish background, kind of mimicking a bright kitchen window. So something like that. So that's just going to be our background lighting. And you can see straight away we've got this kind of kind of clay render because we have no materials on any of our scene objects. So let's just go to the HDR. I'm just going to increase the brightness of that, make it brighter. There we go. So that's our kind of background and environment lighting. And then we're just going to stick a light in and we're going to make this very basic. So we're just going to put one very big uh, softbox in there. So let's just come out of our camera. And you can see if we dolly out, just have a look around, orbit around. You can see the scene, you can see the studio doing its thing, lighting our various bits of geometry. And it's updating very nicely in our real-time preview. Right, so what do we want to do? We want to stick a softbox in here. So let's go to our Cycles 4D menu. And we've got some light kits and we have a softbox. Perfect. So bring that in. And the softbox comes into the origin. There you can see our softbox intersecting our T. So let's just give that a target before we move it. So in that softbox, we'll have a look in the attributes and you can see that we have a target. So let's give it the cup as a target. So let's go into our scene elements. And here we have our cup. Let's drag that cup into the target. And now when we move this softbox around, you can see it's always pointing at that teacup. So something like that. But we want this to be a really nice big light, which will make it very soft and diffuse. Let's go back into our camera. And then, so that'll update, and obviously we need some more strength, so then we'll go to the strength slider, and you see when we increase that, we've got loads more light, and we've got this really nice, bright scene now. Now, obviously, you would want to make adjustments to this lighting once everything was textured how you want it, uh, but for us, we're going to leave it uh, pretty simple. So that looks pr pretty cool. So what we're going to do is, it, it obviously looks very CG and very flat, and that's because... Um, it's not got any materials on there and uh, we haven't really looked at the camera. So one thing that will make this feel better immediately is if we put some uh, kind of shallow depth of field effect on. So let's go to our camera, to the camera tag. So this Cycles 4D camera is just a, a bog standard Cinema 4D camera, but it, it then has a Cycles 4D tag on, which gives you the Cycles 4D options. So in the tag, Let's go to the settings tab and we'll just increase the size in our depth of field settings. And you can see, look, we're blurring that out straight away. Now, we haven't um, selected the, um, the focus point just yet. So we've blurred out the hero, which is not what we want. So let's just grab this focus picker, click on our splash. And there we go. We've put that into the correct um focus. Excellent. So already that looks much nicer with the teapot and the background elements um, kind of uh, blurred out a little. Very nice. So let's just leave that as is for the time being. So what we're going to do now is we're going to concentrate on texturing our fluids for this shot. So we're only really interested in texturing our um, uh, texturing our 
uh, liquid simulation, our open VDB mesher. So what we'll do, let's go to, we'll go down to our material manager down here in the bottom left, and we'll go to the Cycles 4D menu, and we'll bring in a surface material, and we'll bring in a glass. So let's click on that, and we'll drop the glass onto our open VDB mesher, and then straight away we have uh, almost water-looking uh, render there. I say almost water looking because there's a setting we need to change. So let's just double click on our glass material, which will bring up our Cycles 4D node editor. And the glass material is just one shader, this glass BSDF. And what we need to do is change the index of refraction. And I'm not entirely sure exactly what the index of refraction that T is, uh, T without milk. Uh, but I'm guessing it's going to be very close to water, so we'll put 1.33 in there. And now effectively we have a water um, material for here, and it looks pretty convincing as a water splash. That's looking good. So what we're going to do now is, at, at this stage, um, it's easy to make the mistake that if we want to give this some colour, to make this a kind of like that rich red colour that T has that doesn't have any milk in, um, then we'll just colour this glass BSDF shader. And we could do that. Look, let's go into the colour and we'll add a kind of a, an orange tint. So something like that. The problem with that is it, it kind of looks okay, but something's not quite right with it. Um, and this is because in, in the real world, this isn't how the colour in this type of liquid works. It isn't the surface of that color, of that object which is, which is coloured. It's actually the way in which um, light is going through the volume of that. So we need to actually make this a volume um, material. So the way in which we do that is we're not going to colour the surface, which is, if you see, look, our glass shader is going into the surface of our output. So let's just put that back down to white. And instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use a node which is going to pipe into the volume of this object. So let's right click and we'll go to shader and we want a volume absorption. So this is the light rays being absorbed as they go through the volume. And we will plug that into the volume. And as soon as I let go, if you have a look at the real-time preview, you'll see it change. So now it's, all, it's definitely looking more realistic, even without any um, colour value in there, just with this grey. And what you can see is the... As the, the, the kind of the more dense parts of the volume where light can pass through the volume for a longer time is much darker and the thinner parts are lighter and straight away this is looking more realistic. So this is the strategy that we need to do. So what we will do is now we've got our volume absorption, we can adjust that colour again. So let's go bring in something like this. All right, and let's just move frames a little. So you can see at this point, with these values, we have a little bit more colour in the uh, more kind of voluminous part of this mesh, and it's gone really light. We've almost lost all of that in the crown splash. So what we're going to do to address that is we're going to increase the density value. So let's start increasing this density value. Now, we're not working at real-world scale here. This is a fake simulation where we're faking the effects of this cup. So in reality, this cup is huge. It's over a metre um, wide. So we're not interested in real-world values here of what the exact density value of this should be. We are artistically eyeballing it to get the look that we want. So we'll increase that density. And what we want is we want it to be pretty kind of rich in colour in the areas where um, the volume is, is bigger and we want to have some 
loss of that colour value in the thinner areas. So something like that. Now, also, um, obviously, when you're doing this for a, a scene, you will have references of exactly what kind of colour you need for the liquid you are simulating. And so you work off your references. But um, often black tea that doesn't have milk in is more red than you may imagine. So let's just creep that more into the red. Something like that. We can perhaps increase that density just slightly. And something like that is looking pretty nice. Let's go back a frame. So here's the start of our animation. And we'll come through to a bit where we've got a nice big splash. So you can see where it's thinning out, it's losing that and it's becoming more clear, which is the look that we want. I'd say maybe there's arguably we've gone a little bit too much on the red, but again, without working two specific references at this stage, it's very easy for your eye to start playing tricks on you. Um, so what we'll do, we will leave it at that, but obviously when you're um, colouring yours, you need to uh, work off your uh, references. Now you could be at this stage, if you're experienced with Cycles 4D or other node editors, you could actually... Um, create a more complex colour. So at the moment we're just using one colour using the HSV colour values here to then drive the colour of that volume absorption. But you could input a more complex colour arrangement into this node and that could be using uh, a facing node um, or using a Fresnel or uh, different types of gradients to further manipulate how this volume is coloured. Uh, but for us, this is working perfectly and that's looking really nice. So what we're going to do is we're going to shut down that node editor and that's working really nice for now. And you can see immediately, if you look at have, have a look at that real-time preview, um, it's looking really nice, isn't it? So we've successfully created that mesh and then we have lit and then put what is an actually really simple um, fluid material on that mesh and it's looking pretty realistic. So we're now in the position where we can start doing a couple of test renders to the picture viewer. So what we will do, let's go to our render settings and we uh, make sure that our renderer is set to cycles 4D and we'll have a look at our cycles 4D settings. Now everything is in the default setting at the moment. So we're not going to be looking at every single setting here. Actually, we're going to be looking at very few settings here uh, to get our uh, finished render. First of all, I'm going to ensure that my device is set to CUDA. Now in this system, I've got two 1080 Ti's. So it's not a beast of a render machine by any means, but pretty decent. So we want to use CUDA, which gives us a uh, nice speed of render. So then we can just minimize the device settings uh, we're not using render node, so we can ignore that. The performance will leave all of this tile information on the defaults. And we will have a look at our uh, integrator settings. So in this scene, uh, we don't actually have any problems with very hot pixels, which are called fireflies. Now, sometimes when you're using particularly reflective materials, you can see super bright spots, pixels, and these are called uh, fireflies. And this is um, just a, a symptom of path tracing render engines. And one of the ways in which we can reduce the likelihood of those fireflies is by, if we have a look in our integrator settings, we can clamp the direct and indirect rays. And by clamping that, we can stop those fireflies. Now, we don't have any in this scene, so we, we don't need to use these. And you don't want to have any clamping if possible. Uh, it means you can have a much brighter image. The more you start to clamp these direct and indirect rays, the more you're going to darken your image. And it'll also kind of have the effect of flattening it out somewhat as well. So we have no fly fireflies, so we don't need to do any clamping on the direct 
or indirect. We can leave it on zero. So we've also got a samples, and this is how many samples the renderer will use per frame to render it. And the rule is the more samples you have, the cleaner the image, the less noise in your render, but obviously it will take longer to render. And if we just have a look and go back up to our real-time preview, we had the sample set in the preview set to 15. And that gave us this image, which is pretty clean, but there is some noise in and around where we've got this reflective and refractive caustic light and we've got some noise in our material, especially where it's blurred out, that reflective material is a little bit noisy. So that's saying that we need more samples in our actual render. But there's some tricks we can use here because what we want to do is make this render time as short as possible. So what do we do to make sure that we are getting an efficient render? Well, first of all, look, let's just deselect save. We don't need to save for now. And we'll go to our output options. And let's just say that we want to render the current frame only. So just one frame. And we're just rendering pretty low resolution here, 720p. So then we'll go back to our cycle settings. Now, look, we have the sample set to four. But we already know that 15 samples isn't quite enough to clean up this image, especially round here. So let's put this on, say, 30 samples. And before we do a test render, let's just have a look at the other settings. Everything else we're going to keep default. We have maximum ray bounces at 12. We've got a good amount of transparency bounces and transmission bounces as well. The only thing we don't have is um, uh, volume bounces and we are using a volume material. So let's put this up to one and then everything else we will leave on the default settings. So now that we've done that, let's just pause that real time preview so that's not doing anything. Uh, this would be paused automatically when we render to picture viewer, but I always like to pause it before we start uh, doing anything else and we will hit render to picture viewer. And so it's going to load in that VDB mesher data and all of the lights and whatnot and start rendering. And each tile is going to render those 30 samples. And it's obviously pretty quick, but not the fastest render in the world. But this is looking pretty clean. We're looking in these blurred out areas and there isn't really much noise. It's looking good. But you can see we've still got a little bit of noise here um, in the more complex part of that render. And if we just zoom in a bit, we can clearly see the noisier part. So we may actually feel like we need more samples than that 30 to get a clean render. So let's just shut that down and let's boost this up to say 50 samples. Now the problem with this is, this is gonna give us a really clean render, but it's gonna take loads longer to render through um, uh, because it's having to do loads more samples per tile. So you can, I mean, we can look, you can see already how much longer this is taking to render. So what we'll do is we'll just pause here. We'll come back when it's finished. We'll look at how long it took and we'll have a look at the result. So that render's finished and it took one minute and 20 seconds to render. So a massive amount more than our original 30 samples, 32 second render. But this has cleaned this up. Let's just zoom in a bit. And we've got far less noise in this area. So let's, uh, let's compare. So this is the much longer render. And I'll click onto our shorter render. And there, look how much more noise there is. So obvious. So what we really want is, at a minimum, we want these 50 samples to be able to clean up this part of our liquid. This is the hero part of the shot, after all. But that means that we have got 120 seconds per, uh, one minute and 20 seconds per frame for this animation, which is 300 frames long. So this is gonna be a long render. So is there anything that we can do to maintain this quality but to reduce this render time? Well, thankfully there is. So let's just shut down our picture viewer. Let's go back to our render settings because 
in um, this version of Cycles 4D, we have a feature called Adaptive Sampling. Now, this is fantastic because what it will do is it gives us a range. If we activate Adaptive Sampling, you can see that now we have a minimum samples option and then the samples, which becomes a maximum samples option. And then we have an adaptive noise threshold. So what this does, it analyzes the scene and it only provides up to the maximum samples in areas where it detects more noise, where it feels it needs it. And then the areas of the scene that aren't, uh, that don't require that many samples, it uses fewer. So for example, this area down here that's in focus and there's nothing going on, obviously doesn't require 50 samples to clean up the noise because there's not going to be an awful lot of noise in that area. So how it works is we have the adaptive noise threshold and what this amount means is the lower this value, the more likely it is to use up to your maximum samples and the higher this number, the more it's likely to use towards the lower samples. So with that in mind, let's put this down to... Uh, 0 0.01, uh, 0.001. So this is going to use m much nearer the higher end of these samples. But let's see, we'll do a render with that. So without the adaptive uh, sampling, the render took 1 minute and 20 seconds with that maximum of 50 frames. Now I can already see that this is rendering more quickly. So we'll I'll stay with you on this one. So we can see a huge speed increase here. It's going to be nowhere near 1 minute and 20 seconds to get this entire frame done. So look at that. It's reduced it back down to 32 seconds, which was actually the same as our render at the top that used a flat 30 samples all over the image. So let's just compare... The newer one, which took 32 seconds, with our 50 sample everywhere uh, render that took a minute 20. So here is the fast 32 seconds, and there is the better quality one. And the results, I mean, they're negligible. Let's zoom in. So this is the newer 32 second adaptive sampling render. And then we'll flick onto the 50 samples everywhere all over the image render. And it's, it's, it may not uh, be obvious due to the compression of this video, but the quicker adaptive sampling method is fractionally more noisy. Fractionally. But we have saved all of this render time. And if we compare, interestingly, our 30 sample render took 32 seconds. Our adaptive sample render took 32 seconds as well. So let's compare those two. So this is the adaptive sample render. Let's click on to the one that used 30 samples everywhere. Much noisier, but the same render time. So that is fantastic. So what we could do, we could even try, in production environments, sometimes you just need to get this out as quickly as possible. So let's just try going back to our settings and let's put this up just a little. So let's put point zero zero five. All right, let's hit play, hit render. Let's see what we get. So this should be quicker than 32 seconds but it's going to introduce a little bit more noise but yeah I mean you can see how quickly that's rendering 15 seconds so again let's compare those so we'll just zoom in a little bit so this is our 15 seconds adaptive let's compare that with the 32 second adaptive render so this is the 15 that's the 30 that's the 15, that's the 30. So you can see that the shorter render time is way more noisy, 
but it may be something that you can get away with. Let's compare this 15 second render to the 32 second uh, render which used uh, 30 samples everywhere. So this is the 15, here's the 30. Similar noise levels, probably the 15 second one is slightly noisier than that. So let's come out of there. Let's go back to our render settings. I'm going to put this back down to the 0 0.001. That's the amount that we're going to go with. And we can handle that for our render. So now that we've got all that set up, let's go to our output. And we'll do all frames, but then... Remember, because we've retimed this sim, we don't start getting our splash until frame 80. So let's do this from frame 65, which just gives us a few frames first before the splash begins. That's looking pretty good. All right, so that'll do. Let's hit render. This will start rendering through. And this is going to be around 32 seconds per frame. So we'll leave this rendering away and I'll come back to you when it's finished. We'll talk about how long it took and we'll have a look at that final result. So here we are in our picture viewer that took one hour and 51 minutes to render and we rendered uh, 235 frames. So let's hit play and see what we've got. So, yep, that's looking really good. Uh, we've got a really clean render. We've cut that down and made it efficient using those uh, adaptive sampling render techniques. Remember that we slowed down our cache of our open VDB mesher to get kind of half speed, this super slow-mo look, and everything is working really well. I'm very pleased with that indeed. And, of course, once you've cached your open VDB mesher, you can run off lots of different simulations at different speeds. You can even do kind of um, speed ramping um, as, as well. So lots of options even after you've got this cached, uh, but that's looking really nice. So this obviously is an example of our T fluid splashing up in our kind of draft scene with all these clay objects. But let's have a look at what a similar um, simulation might look like with a full render. So if we have a look at this render here, here we've got a really nice um, uh, render with, let's just put that down to real size. So we've got this nice spoon in the foreground. Uh, obviously we've got this kind of uh, bump and displacement on our wood grain and what this really nice bright window in the background. So that's looking very nice and we hit play. You see, this is once it's cached through into that RAM. So this isn't slowed down, this one. This was the, the splash played at real time, which gives us a slightly different look. But there we can see it looking really nice in this um, fully kind of set up render with appropriate materials.